When I uh, went uh, from Texas to Alberta, I got involved in uh, human rights issues. A uh, minister of the government of Alberta uh, gave me a ton of work, and he had a separate agenda. He called me in one day and said, there's a reason why I gave you all this work. He said, I want you to help your people. I thought, well, us architects need a lot of help. He says, no, you're Native people. Um, my uh, father is First Nations. He comes from the uh, uh, Good Striker and the First Charger clan, uh, who uh, were the first warriors that met their adversaries. They didn't believe that uh, you should kill your enemy, uh, that, you, uh, that your enemies were your brothers, and so you wrote, first chargers rode in a battle with nothing but coup, coup sticks, touch a vulnerable part of the enemy and say, you see, I can kill you right on the spot. I'm stronger than you. You better come and talk to me, because the next warriors that come up won't be so kind. So the first chargers put their lives on the line that the other people would be human beings and, uh, and come and talk rather than uh, kill their own species. So that's my father. My mother was, uh, was very German. And, uh, and so uh, my grandfather is from Bremen, Germany. And so I have these two world views. These two world views are totally different. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and loving both my mother and father as I did, I, I saw that these two worldviews each had validity, but they were absolutely and totally different. And when I was asked by the, uh, 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 the chiefs of Alberta to help them deal with the uh, white paper policy that was put out, that was a termination policy for First Nations, in the 60s, I was asked to, uh, to develop a, a, with them a, a concept where they wanted to take control over their own education. Um, and so I was very much involved in the Indian control of Indian education and, and the foundations of self-government. We then developed the first Indian school that created a precedent so that Native people could be involved in the and the education of their own children. And then ultimately, I developed master planning of communities and also the First Nations University. Uh, so I've been very much involved in First Nations issues. The first thing when I uh, um, went to, uh, uh, when I was uh, asked by the 52 chiefs to represent them and uh, defining their vision and their dream for their future was uh, they said, well, you know, we don't want one of our own people telling us what to do. And you've got this very strong European education. That's very nice. But we have to put you through a training program. And that training program is that we're going to teach you about where we're coming from. Because uh, we're coming from a whole different worldview. And unless you understand our worldview, you cannot serve us. Because your job is to bring our vision into reality. It's not to bring your vision into reality and, and uh, you know, shove it down our throats like everybody else is doing. Your job is to bring our vision into reality. So uh, they took me on a journey with them of, uh, of fasts and sun dances and all these uh, different rituals, there are two different worldviews that indigenous people have. And one, of course, is the Western worldview, which uh, this university represents, and the other is the indigenous worldview. Just to give you an idea of the difference of worldviews, uh, the worldview that we have here is a hierarchical worldview that comes from Europe. And it's based on power and control. And it's primarily a patriarchal worldview. And uh, in contrast to the indigenous worldview, which is a circle where everybody is, is equal, where each person is noble, 
On, uh, on the hierarchical worldview, there's only one noble, God save the queen. And, uh, but in the indigenous worldview, everyone is noble. In the hierarchical worldview, everybody uh, has a place in that pyramid. And it's a very structured society. So the system is based on a patriarchal system, placing men at the center of power. It requires man to be dominion over nature in his own nature. And it is his responsibility to hold the hierarchical system and seek the place as close to the top of the hierarchy as possible. It's a competitive society of winners and losers. And man is required to sacrifice his life if this hierarchy demands it. And man is the head of the nuclear family. That's the European worldview of which you're a part of. The indigenous society is an extended family. It's primarily a matriarchal society, which is, encourages cooperation. And emphasize living in harmony with nature and our own nature. The children are at the center of the community. And the mother serves the children, the father's dedicated to serve the family. The women chose their leaders from observing the behavior of their children. So you see the two different worldviews. It's not about race, it's about worldviews. The hierarchical worldview is one of good and evil. It's a binary world. It gives power to the evil within us. We are born with original sin and must seek salvation to be at one with the creator. So man created laws that define evil in hierarchical organizations around those definitions. There's assumption that we're not fully responsible for our actions because evil is so powerful. You know, we're not responsible. The devil made us do it. Because of fear, we sometimes give the responsibility of charting our lives to others we regard more responsible, like the church and the state. See, we are not fully responsible. There's always somebody else more responsible. In the indigenous worldview, people are beautiful spiritual beings of light housed in flesh, connected to the creator and all living beings, as well as the universe and beyond. There is no evil. There, one does not need to fear themselves nor the creator, which is the embodiment of love and caring. There is a belief in following one's own heart and one's own higher self where we are godlike beings and we are basically loving and caring creatures. There's only good and a crooked good that needs to be straightened out. They wouldn't even give even a, evil a name. It's a mental space that everything is good, everything is wonderful. Things sometimes, if things get off course, they just need to be straightened out. So we're fully responsible to straighten out our own negative thinking or we'll give ourselves a headache or make other people around us suffer. We may even affect our whole environment. We have to be fully responsible to keep our minds in a good way. So that's a whole different way of being, a whole different way of thinking. So a hierarchical worldview believes that a child is a tabula rasa, a clean slate. Knowledge like a pitcher of water. You pour into the air and you go to university and you're filled up with all this stuff this outside information. And when you conform to all the guidelines that you have and you jump all the hoops that you do, uh, you get your diploma and that places you in the level of the hierarchy which is predetermined by society. To gain credibility, you seek the knowledge of others. And the only contribution you make must be legitimized by those deemed more knowledgeable than you. That's all your papers in university. If you don't have a bibliography, you know, to, to make certain that uh, that knowledge comes from somewhere else other than yourself, then you get a failure. Because knowledge is outside yourself. It's not within yourself. So you're programmed that way. So you're programmed to believe in that worldview. Now the indigenous society are born complete you seek knowledge from within yourself and the creator that guides you. The knowledge that has little value unless it's relevant to your own inherent knowingness. We are the grandchild of all our ancestors that came before us. And we are the grandparents of all the future generations. Within us is all knowledge of the past, present, and future. So that's a whole different way of thinking, a whole different way of being. 
So the hierarchical worldview has created powerful technologies like this computer, but all these, these technologies were designed for weapons of mass destruction. This was designed to zoom in in the back pocket of a Russian and plant an atomic bomb. That's our computer technology. And the internet and all these things and all the technology we have, it's about competition. It's all about uh, power and control. And the whole society is dominated by fear. Because the only way they can control people is through fear. So there's always these things that you have to fear. And there's always somebody, this church or state, that's going to protect you. So what freedom do you have with that kind of programming? The indigenous worldview emphasizes creativity and ingenuity, balancing the needs of the people with the resources they need to survive. It requires a basic knowledge of the environment and the reality grounded in the understanding that one's place in the universe. It regards the hierarchical worldview as an illusion that has little relevance to the true nature of man and his relationship to his environment and his creator. To reject who you are to fit in this illusion is a rejection of the wondrous being that God has created. One must celebrate life and embrace love oneself, for only through love will you become a knowledgeable being. So this whole program of trying to integrate First Nations into a, a worldview, an indigenous worldview, into a hierarchical worldview, will not ever work. Not in a million years will indigenous people buy the hierarchical worldview. So if you're interested in developing a, an indigenous center on the campus here, it is respecting the fact that the people who will be involved in that center have an entirely different worldview. And, uh, the, and I have found that from my own experiences, both European from my German mother and First Nations from my um, Blackfoot father, that, uh, that I can see that, and as the elders predict, that these two worldviews should come together. That we have a lot to learn from each other. Yes, we have all this great technology, but what are we going to do with it? Because we're destroying all of life on this planet the way we're operating because we're so disconnected from each other and so disconnected from our, from our environment and, and from our resources. So as far as the ind indigenous worldview and the elders that have been here thousands of years, they say, yes, we have this plague that has come here, has polluted all of our rivers and polluted our waters and everything else. But the plague happens to be not the people it happens to be the worldview, and that worldview has got to change because we, wa we won't be able to live on this planet in harmony and balance unless it does change. So I'm saying that it's a great opportunity for people to understand and embrace another worldview of harmony and balance because one can learn a great deal from that. So how do you plan for people that are connected in this way, that have this symbiotic relationship with their environment, that regard everything, the trees, the herbs, the plants, the animals, the fish, all of these things as their relatives. When they talk, they say, all our relations, that's every living being. How do, you, how do you deal with people who don't see themselves as physical entities, but see themselves as life forces? That life forces that are all connected to each other 
and all connected to everything that's living. It reminds me when I work with First Nations, and I am working now with uh, developing an indigenous center for the campus of the University of Saskatchewan, and also working with the First Nations community, Long Point in uh, northern uh, Quebec. And I'm reminded how really, uh, really connected the people are in their environment and having this symbiotic relationship with nature. So I wanted to share with you some of the planning process. Now, this is their philosophy. And at one time, we were all indigenous people until uh, we decided to disconnect ourselves from our environment and from each other. All life is connected. We follow the natural law, the basis force of nature, earth, air, fire, and water. We are an intrinsic part of all life on this planet, no matter how insignificant it may appear to us. You see that, that spider on that flower? The elders call that little creature Manitousis. Manitou is the great spirit, the spirit of all of us, of all living beings. But that little being is just as important. Because without that being, without the microbes in our body, those little microbes that digest our food, we can't survive. They're little gods within us. So that's their thinking. When we surrender to our higher self, we can connect ourselves to our life force. This force is connected to the life force of every living being in the planet, as well as the earth itself and the universe beyond. The First Nations, they look at everything as life forces, as spiritual beings. So when we define ourselves as our ego, rather than a higher self, our spiritual being, we disconnect ourselves from this source and disconnect ourselves from each other and from all life itself. So when you start talking about yourself as I, as separate, disconnected from everything, that's an ego trip which disconnects you from everything. But when we communicate with the Creator, like if you're a pipe carrier like I am, where you carry a sacred pipe and you use that to connect yourself to all of creation, you turn the pipe in the six directions and say, I connect myself with all of creation. Because if I connect myself with all of creation, I connect myself with the Creator of us all. So you turn the pipe in the six directions, say, connect me with everything, because I want to speak connected. However, there's not only six directions of power in our universe, there is a seventh direction. This is the power of the spirit, the creator within ourselves. We are the seventh direction. We turn the pipe to ourselves. We are gods on this planet because we have the gift of creativity. We are the seventh direction on this planet. We are an intrinsic part of creation and we are at one with the creator. Thus, on this planet, we are co-creators and have been given the powerful gift of creativity. We're godlike beings. Only human beings have been given the power to create and we have this power to destroy. We have been given this marvelous planet to live on. But we human beings have the power to destroy this marvelous creation and all of life itself. That's the power of our magnitude. Connecting to the seventh direction requires us to respect all life, including our own. It requires that we embrace the soft power of love rather than the hard power of force inflated by our ego. We can only be connected when we understand that the soft power of love 
is much more greater than the hard power of force. So when we are aligned to the creator, when we are connected to the creator, connected to everything, that's when we become powerful, magical beings clothed in flesh. We become sorcerers because we're connected to the source. When we embrace that awesome power, we must take full responsibility of how we exercise it. You have to understand how powerful we are as human beings. What an amazing gift that we have, that gift of creativity. We can say, I think we'll fly like an eagle, and we'll create flying machines. I think we'll fly faster in sound. We'll do so. I think we'll fly to the moon. I think we'll fly to Mars. And we create those technologies to do that. That's what wondrous creatures that we are. But we have an awesome responsibility of the power that we have. And we're not exercising that power properly. Because we're using that power not only to destroy each other, but to destroy all life on this planet as well. The universe is all powerful. When we are connected, you become a channel for that energy. Each individual has the power to make a difference in the course that humanity takes. It is the creative efforts of each individual that determine the destiny of our future. So with this knowledge comes an awesome responsibility. This is what the responsibility that the elders had before contact. That's why when people came on this land a few hundred years ago, there was a veritable Garden of Eden here, because everything was in harmony and in balance. They had as many people here as they had in Europe before contact. But the land was in balance and harmony. Because their philosophy was to respect all living beings on the land we share, maintain balance and harmony with our environment, create the systems we require to be sustainable, heal ourselves, our families and communities, and all people who share the land with us, and heal our traditional lands, our environment and heal Mother Earth, the source of all life on this planet. That is their commitment. And I think that that is something that the elders and their prophecies and their teachings should be able to share with people. And that's why I have done my best to try to preserve those teachings of the elders, why I made that commitment to uh, to bring that First Nations University in Regina into reality. Well, I'm still working on trying to develop a center for teachings, the elders' teachings in Victoria Island, and hopefully be able to channel some of those teachings through the universities. So when we plan for the future generations to thrive in our lands, we must also plan for the future of living beings that share the land with us. And we must plan for the future of our life givers, for without them, our future is in jeopardy. Like, you call this planning? You call what we're doing in our cities planning? You call clear-cutting planning? It's like having a Safeway store and, no, you know, and people just coming in and taking everything and having no inventory. Like, there's a, it's not a bottomless pit. Well, that's not planning. That's exploit, exploitation. Like when you plan, you should plan for the future of all living things, not just human beings. I mean, what are you going to eat? What are we going to smell? What about trees or whatever? We're, we, we can't just plan for human beings. We have to plan for all of life around us living together. So how do we plan for interconnectedness? So there was this group. They had fought for 100 years, and they finally got 70,000 acres of some of their land back. So they said, would you come and plan for seven generations? Because that's the generation that's affected. So whatever you do affects seven generations. So would you plan for seven generations? I mean. Where have we been, even in one generation? Look what we've done to our environment and our cities and everything else. Are they fit places to be in? 
So I was asked by this community, the elders said, plan for seven generations. Okay. This land, the first thing they did was define this land. This was Kamloops is across the river, and their First Nations is next to Kamloops. So don't plan it like Kamloops. For one thing, uh, they're polluting the river there and killing all the salmon. And they planned a whole community all around their sewage systems, like they planned it all around their assholes. The whole community is not planned around the people at all. And then the, uh, the roads and everything, you know, the rain is hitting these roads, and they pipe all the water, and it runs into the river and pollutes all the salmon. Like, don't do that for our community. So I, I showed them what we did in other communities like that. I planned these communities in these other reserves in Alberta the same way, showed how economically they had nothing and no resources, and how they could actually plan to have a viable community, and how right now their money goes in their hands for 20 minutes before it goes out to support all the businesses in the outlying communities. So I had to do all that economic study with them, showing how they live in their cars because there's nothing in their communities and their lack of proper housing and everything else. That's part of the planning that I have done. But back to this community. So the cultural areas were very important to them. And these cultural areas had to preserve, be preserved because they have tremendous significance to them. So I worked with the elders to find all the cultural areas. Then also, there is these traditional land use areas, the areas where they're fishing and hunting and berry picking and herbs. I didn't realize they had a, it's called balsam root, that actually pumps up their immune system. And uh, they have all these herbs and roots there that they want to be preserved as well. So we defined those areas. I did the same with these other communities. And also their historical areas that had to be defined. I was working with one community up north with this sacred mountain, which was there for thousands of years that people would fast. And somebody in Quebec bought it. It's like buying the Brooklyn Bridge. What right has the province of Quebec selling a sacred mountain of the Algonquins to some jerk in Montreal? Give me a break. Here, the elders wanted to show me which areas where the species were at risk, that their great-grandchildren are not going to even see these species. And so I had to make sure to plan the future for these species when I was doing the land use planning. And also about the sheep and the bear and all these habitats, I had a plan for their future. But they said, we're not going to define which areas of the bear or whatever because they would be endangered. Somebody would get a hold of this document and somebody would go out hunting and try to wipe them out. So let's develop the range for these creatures. I did the same things in these other communities, trying to preserve some of these uh, species that are going to be wiped out. And again, the recreational areas for the teachings, for the young people to learn all about the habitats of these animals. Now, the elders even showed me all the paths of all these animals, because we had to respect the paths of these animals in accessing the water, because they're our relatives. Like they are a part of us. So we have to plan for their future because we are these godlike creatures. We could destroy all these species. We're destroying species every day because we're not planning, we're not caring, we're not loving enough to be concerned about the life of other creatures, some that have been here longer than we have 
we're just a new species. So those are the concerns that we had in the planning, protecting the waterway from pollution because that waterway is the life source of all these creatures, all these plants, all these fish, all these animals. Now there's the document. A document that shows man and nature planned for seven generations. Are we doing this? Are you even taught this in planning? No. I mean, this is so important. I mean, uh, David Suzuki would love this. Because this is the way things should be done for seven generations. Our great-great-grandchildren should be able to see some of the beauty that we're seeing now but are being, are that we're destroying. So this is the way that people want to plan their community. Give you some ideas. Like in this area here, they said, okay, we're next to this community. We have to do uh, 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 proper planning here. Okay, let's, let's realize this is an arid area. Let's not put the water in pipes. Let's have the water running on the ground and irrigating the land. And then at, when it runs off the, the uh, streets and off the roofs and everything else, why not pound the water and then plant uh, plants that can purify the water like bulrushes and everything because the wetlands are like the kidneys of the planet and why not use those plants and everything to purify the water so by the time it gets to the river it doesn't pollute the salmon, it's pure. So why not design it like that and then if once we design it off the way the land and the contours work then all that irrigation areas will create a green belt throughout the building. And, uh, and then this green belt, which we'll do is plant, put our housing around uh, that. And then we will connect all that green area with pedestrian walkways, as you see on the green lines. And the red would be the uh, vehicular traffic. And we can totally separate our vehicular and pedestrian traffic so that we could have our children and our elders walk to school without ever crossing a road. And then why can't we then, you know, have our kids take our ponies to school because they can easily do that because they're taking their ponies down the park. And uh, isn't this a better way of living? Like, why are we designing things around our assholes? Why aren't we planning things around, you know, our natural environment and respecting nature and respecting our elders and our children. Why aren't we designing it like, like around our families? So then uh, we had a whole different way of zoning it. We used this cul-de-sac model. But then the uh, women of the community said, okay, you guys, you pretty good, that's fine because I totally involved the people in the planning process, like everybody in the community. Because it was, the important thing is to bring their vision into reality. Not my vision, they're gonna have to live with it, so it's their vision. So the women came in and said, Doug, this is fine, except you see it's too, still too patriarchal. Look what you've done. Uh, you're still separating the women from each other, so the men can dominate and control them. That's the way the society operates. It's one of separating the women from each other so the men can control the women. And they said, you know, if you separate the women from each other, you separate the children from each other. And the children are driving us crazy in our houses because they're social beings. They want to interact with other children. So we want you to plan it for the women and children. This is this is the model that we want. We want the children in the center, and then we want the women in the circle around that and the traffic around that, so that the mother is between the automobile and the child. So this is the way we want our community planned. And they said, yeah, the elders said, well, I want to be part of that circle because then I can give them the language and the culture to the children. And the single mothers said, I want to be part of that because I want to be able to have the other mothers be able to assist me and help me in raising my children. 
So they said, that's the model we want. I said, well, Doug, is there any other communities in the world that have this model? I said, yeah. Oh, London has a series of squares like this. You know? Before they invented the automobile, there were a lot of communities designed like this. So he said, this is the way we want to plan our communities. So then the whole community started. This is a, a Kia type house that I designed that the people wanted and, uh, and that uh, we couldn't get it going in Canada. So here it is in northern China. They felt it was a really good Chinese house. <laughs> anyway, it's all built, it could all be bolted together. It's all out of wood. That's what the people wanted. I'm still trying to get it built in Canada. Here it is in China. When I was planning the community of Oshibugamu, it was the same challenge. This is their traditional Shaptuan. They, they asked me if I would help them. This is all the elders. They stated their vision. They all stated what their vision for their community would be. Then I, um, I took all their ideas and their vision, went back to the office, and I designed their whole village. And then I came back and I presented it to them, all 500 people. Because for me, I'm not working with a hierarchy. I'm, everyone is important to consider, all 500 people. So we all gathered together. And I told them, now you have to understand this. I know nothing about the James Bay Cree. I'm from Alberta, educated in Texas with an office in Ottawa. What do I know about the James Bay Cree? I am here with my interpretation of what I think your needs are. I mean, I listen to you, but I'm going through my cultural filter, and I'm going through my cultural filter, and I'm drawing it away. But unless you're involved in the design process and telling me uh, and criticizing this project, this won't at all suit you. It'll be another colonial act by me. They said, well, you know, we only have a grade two education. How can we criticize you? Look at all your degrees and whatever. I said, universities don't give out brains. I said, you know, you can do this. So they, after a while, they felt comfortable. And then they were like piranhas. They tore me to shreds. And they criticized, and I didn't defend myself. Like, what was it? Was I supposed to defend myself? Nonsense. I sat down and wrote everything down, what they said. Because that was new knowledge. So I took all that new knowledge, went back to the office, and redesigned it with much more knowledge. Then I came back to the community, I presented it to them. They looked at it. OK, that works for the elders, they said. But the middle-aged people, that's fine for the elders. But you know, we need this, and we need that, and whatever. Again, tore me to shreds. Long list, went back, the office redesigned it, came back to the community. Even the kids pointing out, everybody, all the drawings on the wall, 500 people criticized me. Write down all the criticism again and again. Finally, the eighth time I came to the community, presented it. And all of a sudden, there was no, nothing. The chief said, Doug, um, he said to the people, now it's your job to criticize. Silence. Finally, he says, well, Doug, you finally got it. And the people stood up and said, yes, that's our community. And they built it and won a United Nations Award as a village of the future. And we're featured in Expo 2000. So that's what happens when you give people the opportunity to build their own future. And I think as an architect, you have a marvelous opportunity to do that. Because, you know, I'm a 60s child still. Power to the people. You know, because I believe only the people are going to change things. Only the people are going to change their future. And for this community of Oshibugamu, they have changed their lives forever. Because when they moved into their new houses, 
and to they moved into their uh, new village. That was in 1990. Now they have uh, they speak they have a school that teaches Cree, French, and English. A quarter of their kids are enrolled in university level. They all own their own homes, and they all are employed, and they have control of their lives. And I think that's so important because you see in Canada, we still have an apartheid policy here. South Africa was modeled after Canada. South Africa got rid of apartheid. Canada still is apartheid when it comes to First Nations. So that's where all these problems that you hear on the news of all these poor First Nations community is that we're entirely raped of the resources and history. And they're living in the same condition as when I met these people in Ojibugamu that had nothing. They were living in tar paper shacks, far worse than the people than the communities that are reporting today. But uh, but these people, you see, they understood that they had the power to make a difference. And when they understood that. They had no fear at all, because what happens when you're abandoned like that with nothing and you have all these little children, you know, that's going a little too far, the government of Canada, that's just going a little bit too far. And so there was only one way for the people to go, and that was up. And Lord help it, when you put people in that position, they were going to get their community no matter what. And they got their community. There's many communities that need to go through what Ojibugamu has gone through, but the church and state has put so much fear in the First Nations community that they can't rise above it. So uh, these people have risen above it. So these are some of the challenges that you face. Again, we did a hospital in Sioux Lookout I did it in the shape of a medicine wheel. And in this hospital, it combines Western healing, all the latest stuff, doctors, nurses, and whatever, and indigenous healing. And the doctors and nurses were the ones that wanted it the most because they found out that the indigenous healing was even more successful than Western medicine. So they decided to join forces with the traditional healers. So we have in here a hospital in Suluk, a $110 million hospital that serves 30 native communities the size of Germany in northern Ontario that combines both traditional healing and Western healing. And I had the wonderful opportunity of going and visiting these communities. They're totally isolated. The only way you can get to them is by air. There's no roads to these communities. And they're living in these terrible conditions because all the resources are being mined or clear cut or whatever. But this is a hospital that uh, will serve them for the future. The base of the hospital design and everything was the from the First Nations, the people I visited and the elders visited. In the center of this hospital is where everyone comes together. The elders believe that only when the four races are together in the lodge will the lodge be complete because we're all brothers and sisters working together. And in this center of this hospital, which is in the shape of medicine wheel, that's where everybody comes together and, and gets, goes through the healing process both physically and spiritually. So these are the projects that we worked on, two are, and also the one in Washington. For me, what's so important is to understand that the architect really has a wonderful opportunity of bringing other people's visions into reality, your client's visions into reality. But in order to do so, you really have to walk in their shoes. And you have to give 
to your clients the power to be able to bring their visions into reality. And you have to be humble and you have to be egoist, allowing people to be able to express themselves and be open to criticism and regard your project as an opportunity for people's input so that it can evolve to suit them because you don't know all the answers. You'll find the answers in the community. You don't bring answers to a community. But I found that the answers are already in the community. That village was in the heart of those people. And that if you have that opportunity of being able to, to really realize that you're just a vehicle to be that knowledge and that wisdom is within each community you're serving, with each client you're serving, with each person there. These people have a vision and your job is to bring it to reality. Thanks very much.